it nice to be here thank you humans for joining us because we're going to take a little journey into where the non-human is taking us the smart machine that is advancing at an exponential rate and I'm going to share some of the reasons I'm pretty excited and some of my anxieties that mean collectively we have to work out the value code that we want to impose on this world we are creating um, so I am a journalist, I travel a lot, I get to know a lot of startups, and I'm constantly shocked at how quickly um, smart machines are advancing. Um, it's everything from computer vision to large-scale data analytics to sensors, understanding sentiment by monitoring all sorts of data outputs. And it's got to the stage now where um, I've kind of stopped being surprised because I'm expecting everything to be a bit strange. Um, a few weeks ago, a bunch of Russian scientists showed what would happen if you took a two-dimensional image and trained it with a neural network so you can see in three dimensions what the Mona Lisa would have looked like if she was on Instagram doing video selfies. We've now trained um, the smart machine by feeding in the data of typical United Nations speeches to generate a fake speech that is as authentic as anything that you hear in the General Assembly of the Security Council very quickly. We have startups that are quite well funded, that are taking talent from some of the best university labs and creating iterations on what we already knew in very creative ways. We um, for instance, are able to simulate how people are speaking by manipulating video and translate in real time. There's a startup um, called Synthesia that has taken um, a footballer who's not famous for being super smart, but he's very good at kicking a ball, and they've made him sound beautifully polyglot. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Billion million tan murit kwe. Wa ma zala taqtu lo tiflan kull daqiqatayn. Me lo pouvons mettre fin. Nous savons comment nous allons faire. So it's moving pretty quickly and obviously, you know, there's a dark side. The fake videos. Did you see this one of Obama? even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, um, he may have see, said I that, but he didn't say that things. on this video. It's not in the public address. So we thought creativity was the last bastion of the humans, um, but even creativity is now being understood by the smart machine. So we've had music getting better and better. We're now starting to get the plots of Hollywood movies based on sucking in all the data, based on um, what the audience responds to. We now have... Um, Companies like NVIDIA showing you how to be a great artist. You just do a sketch on the left and it takes the database of images and makes it work on the right. Um, and this is, of course, hitting real industries. Retail, Amazon, about three years ago, showed its concept store, which uses computer vision, proximity sensors. You check in with your phone by scanning it, but there's no cash desks. Everything you put in your basket the store understands. So you can go out without paying. And this store, a lot of other retailers mocked, saying it's just a gimmick by a West Coast tech company. 
And then last year, they announced they were opening 3,000 of these stores across America. A few months ago, they opened one in New York. And suddenly, it changes the rules of retail. Now, if you are giving people the friction of forcing them to pay for something in the store, then you're falling behind. So everywhere I'm looking, there are interesting developments. So when you take deep learning, reinforcement learning, the ability of the smart machine to create a real-time simulation. Um, you get interesting projects. This is a project um, from the University of um, Berkeley in the West Coast. Um, it's called Blue. They worked with OpenAI to simulate what would happen if a robot moved its arms in various directions in order to see how the robot would be helpful doing your laundry at home. And we're just at the very early stages of functional machine learning with low-cost robots. Um, but I don't think we can keep still. You can't really afford to rest because it's moving. You've seen um, the videos on YouTube of Boston Dynamics, um, the dogs that go to the battlefield. Um, every time I look now, I don't know if they're making any money, but they're making some great videos. This is the parkour video, and it's simply learning based on simulating and based on doing, together with um, the sensors inside the robot itself, so it can get a sense of where it is in three-dimensional space. So I guess probably the area that I'm most excited about and that's going to affect us in our lifetimes more than lots of other industries is healthcare. Um, because we've relied so much on the human expert the revered doctor. And of course, humans can only take in so much data, and there are research studies published the whole time. Um, this is one recent research study um, published in Nature Medicine. And for its complicated journal title, what it's saying is the smart machine can learn from your ECG to spot arrhythmia better than the human experts. I mean, this is one of the graphs in the article. The um, little red dots are cardiologists and how sensitive they are at spotting things. And the blue curve is the algorithmic model. So it's actually better in many cases of spotting heart defects than the human. And every week, there are new journal articles published that show how healthcare is being rethought by the smart machine. I think we need to celebrate this. It's going to prolong our lives. It's going to help us live um, a higher quality of life, especially as we get older. Um, the machine is better than the human radiologist at spotting tumors. It changes the nature of the human job. You still need the human, but maybe that role is less about doing the physical legwork of spotting and more about advising the patient based on the knowledge. There's, um, I think as we're going to hear a lot more startups, even in Copenhagen, doing some pretty effective things in healthcare. So if you add the ability of the smart system, which is able to process more and more data, and we're just about to open the quantum computing era, which is going to create new drugs through simulation in silico in the machine before it is actually tested with molecules in the lab. Um, it's going to affect all sorts of sectors. It's going to affect transportation. So we're already having startups like um, this is Lilium in Germany, the vertical takeoff electric jet, able to do things that until recently couldn't be done. And this is just one of a bunch of startups doing autonomous vertical travel. Um, there's another one. This is Zipline, active at the moment in places like Rwanda, using these drones that are able to self-pilot, delivering medical supplies, among other things, in places hard to reach by road. Um, what we're entering is an era where everything about the physical world is just another data point. And the friction that we had, the inability to get to a place, to deliver to a place, to know what's happening on the ground, is diminishing. There's a startup called Planet in the West Coast 
that's putting thousands of these nanosatellites this big in constant orbit around the world, creating real-time availability of imagery to show what's happening on the Earth's surface. So, for instance, when Apple was building its Cupertino headquarters and Apple didn't want cameras prying, it couldn't stop the subscribers of Planet's feed getting access to how the building was developing. And this is all data that we've never had before, but suddenly we've got satellites, we've got drones, we've got all sorts of other data outputs that are creating new ways to understand the world. Which means pretty much every business has to start thinking of itself as an artificial intelligence or data analytics business. Even McDonald's now is seeing itself as an AI business. It spent $300 million acquiring an Israeli company so it could understand better in real time what its customers wanted as they approached the drive through So I think we have to stop assuming that the way do we're doing things today is going to be the way we're doing things tomorrow. If the machine increasingly understands not just what we're telling it, but our sentiment, our emotion, the response of our voice, our facial expression. And there's an upside to this, which means the machine is more empathetic. It's more intuitive about what we want. There's an example, an a New Zealand startup called Soul Machines that's developing um, AI customer service bots, but they're not bots as in the instant messaging bots. These are bots that are computer-generated people that are connected to a system that has a microphone and a camera and responds to your expressions. So these are not videos of people. These are the company Soul Machine's CGI computer faces. I don't understand. Yes. No. No. Maybe. And they respond Goodbye. in different languages. Welcome in Deutschland. And the founder used to work in Hollywood um, doing CGI for movies like Kong, he won a couple of Oscars. And, but he's now developing these partly for healthcare advice, partly for governments to interact with citizens, partly for customer service. And it may be a bit spooky, but I suspect this is one of the futures. So there's a lot of ground to be optimistic. There's an awful lot happening. Talked about healthcare talked about monitoring the natural world so we can predict earthquakes, so we can understand weather. Of course, a huge amount of investment money is going into autonomous transport, which will save lives. Fewer people dead because of human error. But it's hitting every sector, and I feel we're just kind of the foothills of what's going to happen. So often, um, games, projects are early to see what's possible. And there's a bunch of um, open AI projects involving games, training the network to learn to play better games. You've seen um, DeepMind's Alpha Go beating the world's best Go champion. But in the last few months, there have been a bunch of other projects that have outdone the humans. Um, this is a game called Montezuma's Revenge. Um, and an algorithm called Go Explore kept getting better and better. But it's easy to dismiss games. You can start to see how the machine is starting to write in a compelling way. So um, you can log on now to um, a website called Transformer. I was playing it at 6 o'clock this morning, starting to suggest the beginning of a sentence, and it will complete the sentence for you in real time. And it's not great news for people who write for a living, because the machine is going to be pretty good at writing. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see. It's not quite there, but the more data it can suck up and learn, the better it gets. The novel that's compelling 
isn't going to be that far away. So where does this lead? Um, there was a cover story in American Wired in February written by um, Kevin Kelly. And his proposition was, we now have so many sources of data in real time. We have so many cameras, billions of cameras out there. Storage is pretty much cost-free. So we're going at some stage soon to have what he calls the mirror world, which is a simulation of the physical world because it's just so easy to capture what's happening in the physical reality and to make it searchable. So if you want to teach kids what it's like in the rainforest of Brazil where the fires are starting, you can take them there. Augmented reality, virtual reality is going to help because you've got all these data points. And we've kind of seen some early proof points. You know, the Pokemon Go speed at which it became a mainstream game, capturing a physical reality and embedding a virtual reality. But we have to think about where we want this to go, because it's not all happy, shiny, aren't we a great startup news. It's also going to be troublesome. Just as email's incredibly useful, it also gave us the problem of spam. What's going to happen when we have this virtual world embedded over the physical world? The filmmaker Keichu Matsuda gave a, an example. He made a short film about what it's going to be like going to the supermarket where you've got all these messages customized to you. So I um, ran Wired in the UK for eight years until quite recently, and I'm constantly kind of going to visit the university research labs and the startups and trying to understand where this is going. And pretty soon we're not going to have conferences that are devoted to artificial intelligence, just as we don't have conferences devoted to electricity, because it's just going to be part of the infrastructure. It's going to be embedded. And if you see what's happening sector by sector, AI is being normalized. In finance, there are so many startups putting machine learning into things that weren't there the day before yesterday. Um, this is CB Insights with just some of the startups using AI for different reasons, for personal financial assistance, for predictive analytics, to help with protecting fraud and regulatory compliance, to help with credit scoring, to help with asset management. Everywhere you go, the ability to process real-time information at scale and decide what to do with it is getting very interesting. I mean, certainly by 100 years out, but I would guess by the lower numbers as well. Um, I think we have general purpose artificial intelligence that is more capable than humans at all, or almost all economically valuable work. So this is Sam Altman, who um, runs something called OpenAI, which um, has taken quite a lot of money from the industry to kind of push forward the knowledge on AI and make it widely accessible. So um, his opinion is that we don't know yet when, but sometime in the next century, we're going to develop a general artificial intelligence that will be better than the human at doing most tasks, um, which has its own risks. Partly, we haven't really worked out how to constrain whether we can constrain this general AI. And it may not do things that are in our interests. And one of the problems at the moment is the people coding this magical future have their own inherent biases. There's some obvious biases, gender biases. So um, these are some of the big research papers over the last couple of years. And almost all of them are published by men who have certain assumptions. We have cultural biases. If we're hiring people, we're going to choose people who think, who speak more like us. We've got some startups already using artificial intelligence to try and counter these sorts of biases. Companies like Pymetrics that try and use neuroscience, online games that stop the human making that decision. They just monitor in real time. But I think we have to accept that the machine, the smart machine, is culturally determined, and it's not 
inclusive. There was one um, research paper quite widely reported recently about the ability of um, the network to identify people's gender f from thousands of photographs. Um, it's pretty good for light skin men. It's not so good for darker skinned women. So we're getting some nice cultural commentary based on some of these prejudices. There's um, growing computer vision recognition, tracking us, tracking our faces, tracking our devices. There's now a fashion company, Adversarial Fashion, that is designing and selling clothes designed to confuse the cameras. If it sees these patterns on your clothes, it doesn't know how to respond. There's girls' versions first. But I think if we really want to know where some of the risks lie, we have to go to China, which has declared its intent to be the world's leading AI power um, within the decade. And a combination of the state plus the universities plus private money are focusing their efforts into understanding pretty much everything and processing it for tracking. And I guess this is my version of the Chinese flag. And some of it is quite fun and a bit harmless. There's the AI newsreader. Hello, everyone. I'm an English artificial intelligence anchor. This is my very first day in Xinhua News Agency. My voice and appearance are modeled on Zhang Zhao, a real anchor with Xinhua. The development of the media industry calls for continuous innovation and deep integration with the international advanced technologies. And then there's education. If you can track individual pupils' performance, that becomes quite powerful. Through its artificial intelligence based adaptive learning system, Yixue Education Inc. realized a five times of learning efficiency for middle school students compared with traditional approach. Students need to take an intelligent knowledge diagnosis assessment at the beginning of studying. This online adaptive test is to quickly and accurately detect students' knowledge weaknesses. But this is where I get a bit more concerned. This is the face recognition in real time. This is a company called um, SenseTime. There's a bunch of these companies that have become supremely highly valued. And the story they tell is, will make your life simpler. You I'm will be the able to get day. into your office building just by looking at the door. And yeah, sure, it gets rid of friction, but it's the little ways in which these sorts of technologies inside China are being used to exert control that are pretty worrying. Sometimes, you know, it's a bit quirky. The machines that make sure you're not taking too much toilet paper, the face recognition toilet paper dispensers that are turning up through bathrooms throughout China, But this is where it gets a bit more worrying. It's an average day in the bustling Chinese city of Xinjiang. But unlike most other mega cities across the globe, you won't find many jaywalkers here. That's because this city, like others in China, uses facial recognition software to dissuade pedestrians from crossing when they're not supposed to. Using strategically placed cameras at troublesome intersections, the city is able to detect jaywalkers. And if you get caught, then your image gets displayed on the nearby screen, and a fine gets sent right to your cell phone. There's one thing getting fined for crossing the road in the wrong place. What about if you're an ethnic minority in a place in the northwest of China, in Xinjiang, where the government is effectively jailing more than a million of you because it's scared that if you're Muslim, maybe you'll threaten the unity of the state? In Xinjiang province, the Chinese government is wary of the separatist threat posed by the Muslim Uyghur population. According to local NGOs, an estimated one million Uyghurs are being detained indefinitely in secretive internment camps where some are being subject to abuse. It's been called the largest mass incarceration of a minority population in the world today. The authorities are using facial recognition cameras to scan people's faces before they enter markets. 
到处都是监控，每天装甲车啊，一些坦克在市区里面走来走去，也没有具体的法律规定，没有它的一些止损。I think this is the moment to ask whether we want these technologies to be used in similar ways here, whether they threaten our values. Because if we don't have this conversation, there are some powerful people and some big tech companies that are going to have it for us. And we're starting to see the risks of not enough public debate. So Google owns DeepMind, an AI team, and it's got into a bit of trouble lately for working on a health project with hospitals in North London and not getting active consent from the patients for their data being tracked. Um, Amazon, too, is getting very active in healthcare, but there's a lot of fuzziness about what actually they're declaring. Some of these startups are starting to get big rebellions among their own teams. So there's a company based in New York called Clarify that's developed a very effective face recognition tool. And then they started saying, we're going to work for a US government project, Project Maven, um, because we think we can be useful. The staff rebelled, some of the staff. Um, the boss starts to post Matthew Zeller why we're doing this. The pressure grew. He gave an interview in which he said, OK, OK, we're going to have a full-time role thinking about the ethics, thinking about minimizing bias in our work. Um, it seems that role never materialized. People inside the big tech companies, because of this pressure, are now starting to respond. In Amazon, they're talking about now a role focusing on algorithmic fairness. We're going to hear a lot of these phrases, I think. At Salesforce, they've talked about having a chief ethical and human use officer. Google now is still facing the wrath of quite a lot of its employees. They're increasingly public. In the American edition of Wired this month, there's a big feature looking at how this debate is starting to damage the core of the company. Um, and there are new phrases being used by Google staffers. One of them, which we may hear more of, you've heard of greenwashing. Well, ethics washing is when you imply that you have an ethical process in place. Sundar, the boss at Google, posted the AI principles they're operating by, things that they will do, they won't do. We're not developing AI for use in weapons, but we're going to still work for the government and military. And it's not been resolved. There are people who are leaving these big companies and saying, well, they're pretending to be guarding ethics, morality, but they're the ones who are unaccountable. So thankfully, the debate is coming into the open. There are academic and semi-academic institutions that are starting to think about the values. The European Union, a few months ago, issued its own recommendations for AI guidelines. And a few of the things it's asking for, a human oversight, a safety protocol, um, transparency so you know exactly how code is being developed, what the code is, accountability, and of course, this. But it's hard to know how easy it is unless we get more involved now. We demand this accountability, this fairness. It's hard to know whether we're going to achieve what we want and avoid the Chinese vision of total surveillance. And everywhere you look, things are moving. I just wrote a book which is looking for innovation around the world, proper innovation inside big organizations, um, not just the big tech companies. And I'm seeing the application of AI in the most unusual places. There's a fertilizer company in Norway that had problems delivering its fertilizer from the factory to the ports for exports. So they decide to develop the, the world's first autonomous electric cargo ship. This is a fertilizer company going into the autonomous transport business. This is a model. The real one is coming into use in a year or so. I was in um, California, where in this barn, a bunch of Michelin-starred chefs 
are making recipes that are being filmed for an app, and they're employed by one of the world's biggest manufacturers of saucepans based in Hong Kong. This is a company called Maya. Maya realized, because everything is now connected, the offline saucepan is soon going to be redundant. So they're developing an online saucepan connected via Bluetooth to the app with the recipes in that these chefs have designed that connects to a conductive heater below the saucepan, which has a temperature sensor embedded in the middle of the metal, so it controls how quickly and at what temperature it's heating up, so you can cook alongside the Michelin-starred chefs. The smart kitchen is about to replace the world of offline saucepans. So I'm going to leave you, I guess, with optimism tempered by um, realism. So technology, sensors, the smart machine, robotics, is going to improve our lives. You know, the baby who is born deaf and can have a cochlear implant implanted and can hear for the first time is a wonderful thing to witness. But I don't think we should just leave it to the people making the tech to work out what the use Hi. cases should be. Hi. Likewise, I don't think we should resist these technologies because they're coming whether we want it or not. And we're biased as human beings. We will dismiss things because they're uncomfortable. The first time you are in the completely autonomous car, it's going to be a, a, bit, a bit weird. Bill Rimmer put his mum in his Tesla and filmed as he said it to autonomous mode. Put me back for me control it. Oh dear Jesus. I could never. But you know, like the next time is just going to be another way to go and play cards with her friends. So I'm going to leave you with a certainty that as flawed human beings, you're just one part of this equation. But if you don't demand a say now, you may get left behind. Thank you for listening.